Good evening, First Assembly, and welcome back to our study, our journey through the Minor Prophets, and we're going to continue with the book of Zechariah, and we were going to be looking into chapter 6 and chapter 7, so please open your Bibles to those chapters, and as we continue to study the book, um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, so you know that we only kind of, we don't go too much in depth into it, and I'm going to encourage you to continually go back over what we study on just on this maybe hour or 45 minute video and go back and study on your own you know just don't take my word for it um, we need to be in a place where we're studying the word of god just like the bereans did okay <clears throat> but you know in this book we're going to talk a little bit about mountain peaks and i didn't have the opportunity last week to share about this but it's called the mountain peaks of prophecy it's a it's a, it's a diagram you can see it i don't know it ain't the greatest right here but it, it, it actually tells us how the prophets we're going to talk about today the prophets and the visions how how they seen christ come the first time which and then how he's going to come the second time to set up his millennial kingdom but you can pull this offline just punch in uh mountain peaks of prophecy <clears throat> and there's plenty of different charts they have there for you to look at but before we start let's pray father we thank you for your word and as we break into your word lord let us lord let us just be uh, overwhelmed by your presence and your spirit let us begin to unfold what you're trying to say in our lives through the prophets. And I pray, Lord, that you would just continue allow your spirit to speak to us. And we just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like I said earlier, <clears throat> please go back and study the scriptures yourself. Just don't take me, or if you listen to anybody else on, on, on YouTube or on social media or even TV or listen to anybody on radio, don't always take the people's words for granted. Go back and see what the Word of God says, and then allow the Holy Spirit to, to show you um, what they're speaking about in, the, in that context. But, you know, when, when we looked at this chart, the, the prophets would only see straight. They wouldn't see from the side view, so they would see more of a, a, a lineal view. And, <clears throat> you know, they couldn't see the difference, though, between the first time and the second time. They just knew it was going to happen, but they didn't know when. Um, we see from the scripture that there's a reference of the first set and the second coming, you know, in the same verse, you know, you have to understand why the Jews sometimes got confused. You wonder, you know, when Jesus first came in, they wanted to take him by force and make him king and that he would begin his rule and that they would, they would, he would be able to kick uh, the Romans out because you remember God gave them prophecies that Jesus would come to the earth. The Messiah would come to the earth and, <clears throat> You know, if, in their mind, they're thinking, well, if we're reading from the Old, Old Testament, and that's what they were reading from, because they didn't have the New, New Testament back then, at that time. Uh, they were reading the Old Testament prophets, and they were saying, hey, this Messiah is coming. Maybe this is, this, this is the guy. Let's put him in kingship and let him start rolling. Let's get Rome out of here. You know, you know, they're saying, if this is the Messiah, let's get him rolling. Uh, get him on the throne, and let's get rid, rid of Rome and roll. And, you know, I understand that when, when they talk about Jesus' first coming and second coming, you know, sometimes if you don't really study, you can see, um, you can get confused. And they weren't thinking the way God wanted them to think. We know that Jesus didn't come to get rule of um, the Roman rule. We know that he came to give us life and eternal life through him, through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection, that we would have eternal life with him. But if you're studying the scriptures, you know this already. <clears throat> they were anxious to get things moving, and I can understand them, you know. How many of us want to see the Lord come back and set up his kingdom? You know, I thought of as we're going to study this tonight. It talks about children playing where Jesus was. Can you imagine it's the millennial kingdom when Jesus sets up his, his kingdom? And like, it just kind of like thinks about it, blows your mind that Jesus, the kids will be playing around Jesus. And we'll be like hanging out with Jesus, walking around. You know, and, and I think it's something to get excited about. I wonder what it will be like when he does come. You know, think about <clears throat> all the corruption we see and the degradation of our society. You know, our, our world is just continually being plain evil. You know. But in Zechariah, he's going to deal with this in both areas. We're going to see some of this stuff today. So if you can, turn your turn to Zechariah. Um, <clears throat> chapter 6. We'll start with verse 1. And so for, in your scripture, should either at if it's in your Bible or maybe on your iPad or your iPhone or whatever you're using, your electronic device, said the vision of the four chariots. And it says, Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots that came out between 
two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. Now, we know that mountains are not made of bronze, so we know that these are you know, a symbolism, kind of like this. You know, we, we look at this, the, the, those two mountains, and <clears throat> bronze is a symbol of judgment. Bronze, we remember the brazen altar and the, and the laver. Uh, they were made of bronze, which uh, represented a, a cleansing or in a judgment. And mountains can also represent strength. But he continually goes on and he says, The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, the fourth chariot dappled horses, and all of them strong. Now some connect these horsemen with those of the book of Revelation. Um, are they emissaries of God? Maybe. Um, we don't know if it's a connection there with the book of Revelation. But he says, he says, Then I answered and said to the angel who talked to me, What are these things, my Lord? Now it's interesting though, when, when you have a question, do you do you ask questions? I mean, it seems like Zechariah asked a lot of questions, but I think I would have too, if he's given me this vision. Okay, what are you trying to say to me? You, you show me these horses, but what's going on? But by him asking those questions, and by us asking questions, helps other people also to learn and understand. And in verse 5, it says, The angel answered and said to him, These are going out to the four winds of heaven, after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot of the black horses goes towards the north country. The white go one goes after them. And the dappled one goes towards the southern or the south country. Verse 7. When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrolled the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried to me, behold, those who go towards the north country have set my spirit at rest in the northern country. Now, the land of the north is Babylon or Magog. And the way the spirit gets rest through this ju is through judgment. He sees these chariots among the bronze mountains, he, the picture of God judging Babylon. Remember, once again, of the short term and long term of fulfilling prophecy, we see, you know, remember God's people just came out of 70 years of, of captivity in Babylon, and now he's telling them, I will judge those who have locked you away, in essence, for 70 years. He says, I will punish them for how they treated you while you were there. <clears throat> now, now remember, he's going to take care of Babylon now, but then that's that's the short term, and then also there's a long one. Remember, he sees through when Christ uh, sets up his millennial kingdom, then that'll be taken care of then. See, he used Babylon as as a punishment instrument for a season, but know that I, what he says he's going to judge them, but also to bring comfort to his people, the ones that treated you so poorly, I will deal with. And and, and I think that goes with anything if. if even in our lives, if, if someone has treated us wrongly, we, we, we kind of want someone to kind of come to our defense or come to our aid. It, we, we, get, we get comfort with that. But see, now we see, we read the book of Revelation, Babylon represents or, um, or is a picture of evil in the world, like religious Babylon, the spirit of Babylon, the, the business of Babylon, the wealth and desires of mankind. Now see, we know that John had seen a vision of of Babylon being judged by God. And here we see, like, in, in, in Zechariah's time, they're being judged. And now, in the future time, Babylon's going to be done. But it's about the evil. And Zechariah is giving us a prophetic overview of God's redemptive plan that we see judgment come to Babylon then, back then when he was in there, and now we see it in, in the future. But let me ask you just this personal question. Do you become grieved at the things you've seen in here in the world which we live in. You know, are we like the Old Testament prophets who cry out and say, How long, O Lord, will this being to you come to judge this earth? You know, I think even with this coronavirus, they're they're making their blown is so out of proportion, but yet what about the millions of babies that are dying every day for the abortions? You know? You don't see anybody causing that to be a pandemic. We don't have to shut down things for that. They they're freely open. You know, I don't want to be in our my my soapbox, but you know, we we really need to focus on, you know, how bad and how dark our world really is. And it's probably going to get a lot more darker until Christ comes back. But you think, you know, we cry, Lord, how long? How long are you going to be till you come back and, 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 and take us home or come back and, and set up your rule? <clears throat> but on the other hand, though, is we know that our God's a graceful, merciful God and that... His delay will give other people opportunity to come to know him, to surrender to Christ. 
See, God is bearing with sin, not because he's soft, but because he loves people. We, and we got to remember that. You know, a lot of times, <laughs> we, want, we want judgment right, right now. But, you know, God says, you know, a little mercy. Let's give some grace. Let's give some mercy. Let's give some grace. John 3, 16 through 18 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the order that the world might be saved through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he, meaning the plural, he or she, has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Listen, we may not like people. We may feel that they are a pain in the backside. Maybe they hurt us, they hurt our feelings, but he is giving everybody an opportunity that, that at the end, of, when he calls the game, when it's all over and he says, you know what, it's time that no one can come and say, well, you never gave me an opportunity, God. Everybody's going to get an opportunity. Even the guy on the island that everybody speaks about, he'll have an opportunity too. Or she will have an opportunity. <clears throat> Just in this little section, we can see what God is doing in his people. Just through that, through that, that through, through what he's doing through through the word, through the through the horses and, and how he's going to take care and how judgment's going to come and fall. But understand that God. God wants none to perish, and God wants, you know, he, we're, we're all his creation, but we're not all his children. That, that's something to think about, because some people say everybody's God's children. Well, not necessarily. Um, there's, everybody's, everything is God's creation. Not necessarily children. I'm a child, you're a child. But someone out there who walked away from God may not be his child no more. So let's get on to verse 9, uh, in the same chapter. It says, the crown and the temple, and the word came to the Lord to me. Take the exiles, Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go to the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Now, you look at the kind of these names. Hadai means uh, robust. Uh, Tobijah means uh, God's goodness, and Jediah means God knows. And it says, take from them silver, gold, and make, make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, this is different to crown a priest. Normally, you wouldn't, there, there's not the king and priest thing. It's just there was a priest, and God set that up. There's just a king, and then there's a priest. God made a clear separation of the priesthood and the, and the kingship. We normally don't see a king becoming a priest and a priest becoming a king, in, just in Israel. Now, that may happen in other countries, but I, you know, in Israel, we don't see that. <clears throat> but he says, make a crown. He says to them, and thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is the branch. We, know, we heard about this a little earlier in, in the chapters. And it says, for, shall, for he shall branch out from this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now, now we know that he's talking about the same, about someone else other than Joshua the high priest. We know that um, Zerubbabel uh, built the temple at, the, at that time. Uh, now, this man uh, who he's referring to is the, the branch, which, which we know refers to the Messiah. And verse 13 says, And it shall be uh, built a temple, or, and is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear a royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and a council of peace shall be um, between them both. Notice that when he says uh, the, uh, the priest on the throne, it's all about Jesus. When this prophecy, um, when this prophecy came, um, could you imagine what they were thinking? You know, what's up with this? We don't have priests who sit on the throne. Um, a priest on the throne, I, I don't understand. But remember a little bit ago when we discussed the priests, that priests were not also kings of Israel. So you have to think in their time, what were they, were, that what was going on there? Why would they think a priest on the throne? I'm a little confused here. But it says back in verse 11, it says, Take from them silver, gold, and make a crown. Set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehoz Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, Joshua in the Old Testament is a form of Greek Jesus, or uh, it's a form of Jesus in the Greek. Um, he is the one to come, and God says that one will be the priest on his throne. Because it says in verse 13, it says, And it is he that shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor. Think about this, and it shall and shall sit and rule on his throne, and there shall be a priest on his throne, 
and the counsel of the peace shall be between them both. That's amazing that when Jesus comes to the earth the second time, he will, he will come as priest and king and bring them to harmony to both of them. A king, we know that a king is one that rules, right? Everybody knows that. And a priest is one who represents. Now, if you remember, if you remember your Old Testament uh, about, the, about the, high, the high priest and the Day of Atonement, the high priest always represented the people before God. Even on the day, once per year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrificial lamb, right? Pour that blood on into the mercy seat of God for atonement for who? For Israel. Right? He would go in every year and, and do this for God's people. He went into representative all of Israel. That's what the priest does. Now, think about this. Are we considered, in a sense, in the New Testament priest? Right? Who do we represent? Right? Think about this. Who do we who do we represent? And we don't do this the thing like that, like they did back then. <clears throat> but that's what the high priest does. But this one also um, will sit on the throne. And this has not happened in Israel before. Okay? This will play take this will take place at a certain time. We don't know when. We don't know when God's even, when God's tell, when he's gonna blow the whistle and say, game done. Okay? And it takes place at a certain time. It says, and a crown shall be. In the temple of the Lord as a reminder. Now, my scripture says now, Halim, uh, Tobijah, and, and, and Jediah. And then it says, Hen, the son of Zephaniah. You get two different names, maybe the spellings. But who is Hen? And why is he mentioned here? That's something for you to study on your own. But Hen actually means gracious. Now, wasn't it, now, a little bit earlier, wasn't it God's intention to place the crown on Joshua? The head of Joshua, right? Back in verse 11. But here it says, make it for him, but don't place it on him. But set it aside as a reminder of the one to come. His name is Jesus. And verse 15 says, and those who are far shall come to help build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of, your, of the Lord, your God. Now, it's interesting that that. They were in the process of building the temple right now and thinking about it. And God uses it as a springboard for the one who will truly build the house of the Lord. When Jesus comes back, Jesus is the master over God's house. And we are, in fact, God's house. Think about this now. So they're building a, a physical temple back then. We are the temple. And that's the crazy thing. We are the priesthood, the temple where God's presence is to dwell in, to live. Jesus is what? The master over this, over God's house. This is God's house, right? Who lives inside of me as a believer? The Holy Spirit. So who's my master? Jesus. Jesus is the master over this body, right? In God's house. But sometimes sometimes as, as we're still in the flesh, sometimes we walk in the spirit. I'm hoping you walk in, in the spirit more than you do the flesh. Because we are to walk in, in the spirit of God. But sometimes we take Jesus off the throne. And we set ourselves up there and we dictate things to him. But actually, listen, my body is, in, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. So it's really cool when you think about this, you know, God built this temple so he can house in it. But he couldn't house in it before before we gave our hearts to Christ, because we there's just so much sin in our lives. Now, not that we we still sin, but now we have the Holy Spirit, and we stand in God's righteousness, or Jesus' righteousness, not not my own. And Jesus is my master; He's the master of God's house where God dwells. Think about it. you can pull it apart as, as you want, but even even as you know, when we think about and when John wrote, and he says he seen he seen it uh, coming down from heaven, a heaven adorned with beauty. Uh, in the book of Revelation, you know, the bride, we are the bride where, you know, where God is to dwell with us and his people. And we are being fashioned together as the body of Christ, all of us. And we are the temple of the Lord, a place where the Holy Spirit dwells. I, I'm it just, I can't wait to see this all visually. Just, 
You know, we think about all the different TV shows you watch, the movies, the science fiction movies, the space movies, and how, what we see at the theaters. Can you imagine what's going to happen when God just starts start lighting the sky up with him and all the angels and everything that's going to happen? I think it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a mind blower. You know, you want a pandemic then, we'll see that, bud. But listen, temples back then were built with an individual, individual stones. Each one was handcrafted, hand-shaped, you know, if, if, if you've ever seen uh, Moses and the Ten Commandments with, with Charles and Esna, how you know, the, the, the slaves would, would make bricks and people would make these stones and make these big Egyptian pyramids. Well, the temple's the same thing in the sense that the temple was made out of stone. Individual stones, they stacked up real nice. They were, fit together, they were fitted together to build a great structure for God's presence to dwell. And like each of us, we're all stones fitted together properly and that God's Spirit is housed inside of us as believers in Christ. There's a lot that we can see, just even, even in this chapter, um, of Jesus is coming. This is both now and later. Um, I, I really like I really really like these last couple of these chapters and Ze Zechariah. You know, the the prophecy we see now and the prophecy going to happen later. And then we're going to go start in chapter 7. So if you have any questions on chapter 6, just email me. You guys know my email. Um, chapter 7 says, Zechariah, the call for justice and mercy. It says in verse 1, In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah in the fourth day and ninth month, which is Kislev. Now the people of Bethel had sent Shalzerzer and uh, Regimelech and their men to entreat the favor of the Lord. Now, when you entreat the favor of the Lord, you're you're actively seeking the face of God. When you know, almost like an intercession, you you really want to hear what God is saying. And you know, a lot of us, when we're facing adversity or facing crisis or we're facing different things, um, we need to seek the face. We need to actively seek the face of the Lord. Whether you want to call it seeking the face of God or entreating the favor of the Lord, it doesn't matter. It's us proactively going after God and you know, and allowing Him to speak to us. But it says in verse 3, saying to the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, should I weep and abstain in the fifth month as have I done so many years? Now, you think about this. What's, what's this all about? Now listen, understand at this time the temple is being rebuilt and some of the people are coming to the priest and saying, listen, should we continually fast and mourn in the fifth month of the year? Basically, what, that was their question. This is when Babylon came in and they destroyed the temple. And every fifth month of the year, they would take this time and, and mourn because the temple was destroyed. So what they were doing, they were asking, do we continue, even though the temple was halfway done, being rebuilt? Now you can understand that, right? Think about it. Babylon uh, army comes in, destroys the temple, and every year, one month a year, the fifth month, they would start to mourn and weep for this. But when they asked the prophet this question, you know, they had to know the prophet was going to the Lord. So the Lord gives the answer through Zechariah to these people and says this in verse 4. But it's not the answer they really wanted. And sometimes when we ask those questions, sometimes we get answers from God we really didn't want to hear. It's like, okay, I shouldn't have asked. But it says, Then the word of the Lord came, the Lord of the host came to me. Say to all the people land and the priests, when you fast and mourn in the fifth month and the seventh and in the seventh for these seventy years, was it for me that you fasted? Now they mourned in the seventh month also for uh do you remember when it's I think I believe it was in Jeremiah and I believe it was in Second Kings. Remember when the governor uh, um Gedalia, uh he was assassinated? Uh, I believe it was in Jeremiah. The temple came down, and then two months later, they, they took out the, the governor of um, uh, Gedela. Um, I think it was in Second Kings too. Um, they erased him. That's kind of why they erased him. That was pretty mean. But that's why they, they mentioned the seventh month, because they were mourning the loss of the temple, and they were mourning the loss of, of, of that man. But the real question is this. Did you really fast for me or for other reasons? Now think about it. Let me, let's reiterate. Did you really fast for me or for other reasons? How often do we fast or we say we fast and we pray in January? First of the year, we want to start a fresh and new. What happens? We 
So we're going to fast, we're going to pray, and it's good to pray, but do we do it on our own, or do we do it for our own? Do we do it for our recognition? Do we do it just out of lip service, or do we really seek the face of the Lord? And this is what they're, he's questioning them on. Because it says in verse 6 and 7, it says, And when you eat and drink, did you eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Were not these words the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited by inhabited and prosperous, and her cities around her and her south and her lowlands were inhabited? See, it's interesting this. They were, com they were commemorating the fall of the temple, but they forgot why. You know, why did God allow the Babylonians to destroy it? It was because of their disobedience. And when their forefathers fasted, they did it to themselves because of religious, they were unfaithful, and they became they they got caught up in empty rituals that meant absolutely nothing. And that's and you think about when we pray and we fast. Is it just a ritual or is it something that means something to God? Is it from generally from our heart? And and what God is saying here is that they're getting a new start in the land. And traveling, but they're tending to travel down that same road of empty religious tra tradition. We know religion doesn't save. It's man's attempt to please God. To re and it doesn't work. Traditions don't, don't, they don't work. You know, things happened back then and it was perfect. It worked back then, but it doesn't now. And it says, you came here asking if you should keep fasting and mourning. Let me ask you this question. Why are you fasting and mourning? And when, when you feast, are you feasting for the right reasons of God's faithfulness, not just to, just to do it? See, are you sorry that the temple got destroyed? Or are you sorry why the temple got destroyed? You know, in other words, he's saying this. Are, are we sorry when we allow all the sins in our lives? Or are we sorry about sin? We are sorry about the fallout. It's like this. It's like a married couple that gets a divorce because one of them or the other one, a lot, you know, maybe they, they committed adultery, whatever it happened, uh, because of sin. And it's interesting. You kind of picture like picture the people celebrating the loss of the temple with this divorce. I'll kind of put it together if you can, but Hopefully I can explain it. So the married couple gets a divorce because of sin. Say the husband cheats on the, the, the wife, right? And they get a divorce. And it's like him commemorating once, once a year in the fifth month, he, he goes and mourns because his marriage failed. Think about this. We're telling God every year we'll go back and look sorrowful by mourning because of the ending of my marriage. Think about this. God then asks, but are you sorrowful about what caused the ending of your marriage? And would ask, well, what do you mean? You know, don't you, aren't you sorry because you allowed the sin in the, in, in, that caused your marriage? You're upset because that you're divorced, yes, but you're not upset because of why you're divorced. You're upset because the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, but you don't, you're not upset because of why it was destroyed, because of your disobedience. And the problem with the Jews, or the, the Jews at the time, and us even today, do we look inward to see why this is happening? And the Jews were refusing to look inward why the temple was destroyed. Isaiah said that even... You know, <clears throat> or even Isaiah talked about their sacrifices are a burden to him. In, I, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13, I like the New Tri Living Translation says this, Stop bringing your meaningless gifts, your incense of offerings, disgust me. As for your celebrations of new moons and Sabbath and new social day, special days for fasting, they are all sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. And that's what was going on with God's people. They were going through the motions and the ritualistic things. It's kind of like coming to church and just doing, going to church. Be just because you think it's something that you did when you were a kid. And you're not coming to church to fellowship. You're not coming to church to seek the face of the Lord. You're not coming to church to surrender. You're not coming to for, for Him, but you're coming for yourself out of religious duties. The English trans translation says this. 
Bring no more vain offerings, incense, and abominations to me. New moon and Sabbaths are calling on convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. If you live in a religious hypocrisy, you bring a sacrifice and you live your lives the way you want. Not for me. You know, you bring your offering, we praise you, Lord, we thank you, but then I go out and do what I want to do all when no one else is around. It's not for me. And Isaiah's saying, listen, it ain't for me either. You know, and, and God's saying, listen, just stop it. Just don't do it no more. Religious hypocrisy probably grieves the Lord the most, I think. You know? Fake worship. Fake. We can put the music on. We can raise our hands. But where's our heart at? Going through the motions with no heart. You know? Their lips are for me, but their hearts are far from me. You know? But Israel was taking on this tendency, and even happens today in today's churches. And what God is saying to them, are you going to be like your forefathers, or are you going to deal with your problem today? Zechariah starts off again in verse 8, 9, and 10. It says this, And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let no one of you devise evil against another in your heart. Now listen, they were doing all of the religious stuff, clockwork, for 70 years, every fifth month. And God is saying, listen, I don't want your sacred religious observance anymore. I want you to treat people kindly. I want you to treat people honestly. And I want you to treat them honestly in business dealings and help out the widows and the poor. Stop doing your religious things and love people in my name. That's what I want you to do. Live different lives and walk out my word. And those words today even are for us. This is what I want you to do. I can hear God saying, live different lives other than the world and walk out my word. Live out his word. Live it out. It says, though, their forefathers, though, resisted it. It says, but they refused, in verse 11, but they refused to pay attention and turn a stubborn shoulder and stop their ears that they may not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came to, from the Lord of hosts. And they called, and they would not hear, so... They called, and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. And I scattered them with the whirlwind among all the nations that they had known, not known. Thus the land they left was desolate, so that no one went to and fro, and the pleasant land was made desolate. God is recounting for them and saying to them, is, this is how you got in this position in the first place. Your forefathers refused to listen, and you, will you refuse to listen also? You know, maybe your parents or your family didn't follow the Lord, but are you willing to follow the Lord? Are you going to take that, chance, take that, that step? Will you learn from their mistake of religious hypocrisy and truly seek the face of the Lord with a genuine heart? That's what he's saying to them. Listen, just because your parents walked wrong doesn't mean you have to do it. And he's saying, listen, here's your choice. You have the choice. Amen. Chapter 8. Uh, the coming, you should say, the coming peace and prosperity of Zion. Verse 1. And the word of the Lord came, the Lord, the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am a jealous for Zion and great jealousy, and I am jealous for for her with great wrath. Once again, we see a promise of future time where God himself will reign. Uh, God introduces himself with the title declaring his power and his majesty. Now, we think about the word jealous. Uh, jealous actually it becomes envious, envy, or zeal. You know, people might ask that if God is holy and God is perfect, but on the other hand, the Bible says that God is jealous God, how do I understand? I don't, I don't get that. Now, jealousy is a bad thing in the hands of bad people. We know that. Jealousy is, can be a pure thing when it, is, when it comes from a, a selfless heart, a pure heart. 
We, we think it's bad because we relate it to us and our jealousy, which only points to me. Jealousy points to me, my desires, my wants. You know, I want things for me. God doesn't have this issue. God is selfless. Uh, when God is jealous, it's for me and you. Uh, God is a righteous, pure heart. His heart is right. He is a pureness to him. Um, perfection. God wants the best for you and I, but when we give our heart somewhere else, God wants that attention. That's the difference. See, when we walk in the world, God wants us, but we choose to walk in the world. And he, and he wants our hearts give our hearts given to him and not to something else other than him. Uh, in our lives, jealousy is a bad thing in our own lives, but not in his. Uh, but verse 3 says, Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the, the holy mountain. There will be a transformation of the city into truth and holiness. But verse 4 goes on and says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, All men, all women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with their staff in each hand, because of great air, staff in hand, because of great age. And the city streets will be, shall be filled with boys and girls playing in its streets. And that's what I mentioned kind of earlier. You know, Jesus is standing there and all these kids. I mean, they had the opportunity that back then to have Jesus next to them. But we, did, we didn't. So for me, I, it, I can't imagine Jesus standing there in, in, in the physical presence and me just hanging out with him. I, I just I honestly can't wait. Uh, but this is a prophetic message of the, of the millennial kingdom. A time when Christ will come at that thousand year period, uh, Jerusalem will be a city of peace because God will be their protector. He, he will be there. They're not going to be picking on them when he's here. But right now, the, you know, a lot of times when you think about the news, and I know that <laughs> the news can be really one side, and we know that with this whole thing going on now, but the news doesn't really broadcast a lot of things that happen in Israel. Like, like bombs, like missiles going off and killing children and people just trying to live a, a, a life. Like, could you imagine just going down to the, you know, the supermarket or going to a department store? We're, we're not right now because we're in lockdown. But can you imagine when you had that opportunity just to go out? You know, but there was an opportunity for a missile to come down from another country to blow you up. Think about that. This is what they go through. This is what they live in. You know, there hasn't been peace thousands of years in that place. See, when you really think about the condition of our country, now listen, I'm not for this lockdown, really. Yeah, we need to be good stewards and we need to be wise. I understand that part. But see, lockdown is not so bad now when compared to a missile hitting your own house or your neighborhood. It's not that bad. You know, a lot of people talk about this, the new normal. We want to go back to normal. There's a couple of people preaching about it. And, you know, the new normal. What's the new normal going to look like? You know, I think one thing I think about is 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 that before the flood, the earth was different. That's how it was supposed to be. The garden. That was normal. It wasn't our normal. It was Adam and Eve's normal until they sinned and they got kicked out. What's God's normal? What's it going to look like? Think about that. You know, there's a lot. People, we, mm. verse 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of the people in those days should it also be marvelous in, in my sight declares the lord of hosts god is saying listen this is my way of putting things back together they were meant to be my creative order you know our planet right now has no resemblance of how god wanted it to be we take like as i meant about normal we take it for granted this is this is what it is this is what the normal is but it's going to be so different back then. It'll be the new normal. And who knows that maybe we have to wear masks six months after um, after whenever our whenever our state gets released. Uh, we may have to wear masks for six months. You know, they may they may have restaurants out there only at half capacity. Um, could you imagine if they did this for everything that came by? What about the flu? The flu's a very catchy virus. So, I mean, is this going to be every time? Who knows what's the what's going to be the new normal? But I think we just continually rely on the Lord, and this He'll be with us. Verse seven: Thus says the Lord of Hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will fear, 
I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. The promise of transformed, prosperous, and safe Jerusalem. The gathering will not just be a, a geographic gathering, but also a spiritual gathering also. And it's not just going to be an address change, but it'll also be a continual heart change in their, in their lives. And verse 9 to the end of the chapter. No, we'll go 9 to 13. Uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong for those who these days have been hearing the words from the mouth of the prophets who were present in the day of the foundations of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid. The temple might be built. For before those days there was no wage for man no, or any wage for beast. Neither was there any safety from the foe for him who went out or came in. For I set every man against his neighbor. But now I will not. I will deal. But but now I will not deal with the remnant of his people as of former days, declares the Lord of Hosts. For there shall be a sowing of peace. A vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give its produce, and the heavens shall give its their due. And I will cause the remnant of the people to possess all things. And as you have been a byword of, of cursing among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel. So will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Do you see what the Lord is saying, though, through, through Zechariah? In that if God is making a correlation here. That the neighboring countries halted them from building the temple through diversity, remember? And God spoke through Haggai and Ezra and Zechariah. Do not be afraid. I will protect you and be safe. And show you, it, But it also shows, though, is be safe. But it also shows a foreshadowing of the millennial kingdom. You know, maybe you heard the law of double reference where it speaks of the near and the far biblical or prophetic fulfillment. So, you know, he's taking care of them now and he's going to take care of them then. Verse 14. But thus says the Lord of hosts, as I purpose to bring disaster to you and when your fathers provoked me to wrath, I did not relent, says the Lord of hosts. So again, I have purposed in those days to bring good to Jerusalem and to, to the house of Judah. Fear not. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another and love no false oath. For all things I hate, declares the Lord. God is asking um, to represent me well with a pure heart, to others and throughout the land, just like us today. We call ourselves Christians, but do we represent Christ right? We're ambassadors. Do we represent our homeland correctly? Through our lives, our actions, our words, and our deeds. And that's what God's asking them to do. Listen, this is what you learned for the last seven years, but now I'm changing the way you think, the way you act, the way you behave. And I need you to do this. This is who you are. I'm separating you from the world. You know? You think about people like, um, even like, you know, it's almost like he's saying, don't mark yourself as the world. Don't. Don't let, you know, when you think about when, when God was making a nation, that he called him out. He said, listen, I, I don't want you to do what, what, the, what the world people do. I want you to do, here, here's the rules I want you to follow. And they, we know that they didn't do that. But that's like us today. God called us out of the world so that we can be more like him. It's a change, it's a change, a transformation. And it says in verse 18, And the word Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth month, and the fast of the seventh month, and the fast of the tenth month shall be to the house of Judah, seasons of joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts. Therefore, Love, truth, and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts. People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of, of one city shall go to another, uh, saying, Let's go at once and treat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I, myself, are, am going. The promise will be fulfilled in the Middle Kingdom. Think about this. Many people, strong nations, shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and entreat the favor of the Lord. Verse 23 says this, And thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men from the, from the nations of every tongue shall take a hold of the robe of the Jew, saying, Let's go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The blessing upon the people 
um, on God's people that he's going to pour out on his people will be so profound that even the once powerful nation or powerful nations at once or ones who used to be a powerful nation who used to come will come to Israel to seek the face of the Lord. Uh, this is to come. It has not yet happened. Uh, there's still there, it's still messy over in the Middle East. But when people see Christ in you and me, the hope of glory, they will want to come to see Jesus. Our lives, we're poster children for Jesus Christ. What is our poster saying to people? 1 Corinthians 1, 27 says this. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the chapter, of, uh, that's the end of chapter 8. That's what 6, 7, 8 we discussed tonight. So I encourage you to, to go back, start reading from 1 again, and reread all the way up to chapter 8, and then uh, go 9, 10, 11, and just keep on reading ahead a few chapters. Continually refill, re, uh, familiarize your mind with what's going on. And if you want, check out, go online. You can just punch in the mountain piece of prophecy, and you can see what I was trying to say. And it's pretty interesting when you see it. This one's kind of like blurry but because I blew it up. But um, it's your, it's your study. Study yourself. Study yourself to be approved. Um, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you, Father, that you're a good and holy God and an awesome God. And Lord, I do wait. I can't wait to see what the millennial kingdom will, will be like and what eternity is going to be like. Lord, I don't, I don't know. And I'm excited to see. But even hearing the children laughing around you and just, just, just having the opportunity to hang out with you. Um, Lord, it's, it is exciting to me. I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And I pray that those who are listening or hearing this, Lord, I pray that you would touch them and meet their every need, that you would strengthen them and encourage them in this time. Lord, let their needs be met by you and you alone. Let them draw strength from you, Father, and not from the world. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Lord, we'll see you next week. Zechariah, start with chapter 9. Be blessed. Have a great week. Be safe.